Welcome to Critical Thought TV. I'm your host, Stuart Mason Dambrot, and we're speaking today with Dr. Randall Kuna, neuroscientist and neuroengineer about substrate independent minds. Um, one of the um, topic areas that I'd like to ask you about concerning uh, substrate independent minds, uh, whole brain emulation, mind uploading, has to do with the ethical and social considerations around uh, these uh, technologies and these possible futures and how you see the issues around them affecting the development of the actual technology that we'll need to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are of course numerous social um, and ethical questions. I mean sometimes it comes down to simple things like, well how do you, how do you develop something like this? How do you test it? How do you make sure that it's uh, uh, that it doesn't uh, hurt people or that they can go through a procedure like that and feel confident that the result is satisfying, kind of like with any other medical procedure. Mm -hmm. But there's an additional component, which is that um, there may be a certain group of people who are interested in the technology, who want to do something like substrate independent minds and participate in it, and a group that don't. And then the question becomes, well, how does that what one group does affect the other. Say that some people do upload to substrate independent minds and uh, doing so does give them all these flexibilities that we just talked about, the ones that, that make it possible to survive in different environments and uh, uh, take on other challenges, meaning that in some senses they may have acquired capabilities that the other group doesn't have mm -hmm. and so it could give them an advantage. And in that sense, even though they didn't really do something negative to that group of people who chose not to participate, the non-participants might say, well, wait a minute, this is affecting me in a bad way. This could somehow have a negative impact on my life. So it shouldn't happen. And then you get the kind of situation where people attempt to put in laws that will forbid someone to make their own choice and to, to participate and try something because it may have an effect on everyone else in a sense where they perceive it as having a negative effect. Now that's, you know, from my point of view, mm -hmm even though I, I understand that point of view, I understand where that comes from. I find it a little bit dangerous because it says, well, my current feeling about what's going on today and my fear that, you know, I may not be as good as the next person. Let's say we have these runners that, you know, are trying to compete now with a runner who has prosthetic legs, who has blades, as they call them, and they're unhappy because he's faster on his blades than they are on their natural legs. You know, they could decide to cut off their own legs and have blades too, <laughs> but of course they don't, right? And so instead they try to forbid him from participating. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the same argument, not mm -hmm. entirely the same, but similar. Um, but then it's not just that, because it's not just about having faster legs. It's that whole idea of how do we deal with other challenges that are coming on? What happens if something threatens the earth or the environment that we're in? What happens if we have a new uh, mental challenge to deal with? Let's say, for example, that we have machine intelligence that gets way ahead of us and that may also uh, impact us in some sense where the effect is not beneficial but negative to us if we can't keep up, if we're not also on that platform, on that, on that edge where that intelligence is. So you can imagine such challenges and because of that in a long-term view being able to be more flexible and adaptable is better. So we need to get past that point somewhere where you know uh, it's just this, this social sort of comfortableness with moving forward that that uh, makes it impossible to go there, so or that that sort of, that throws up the possibility of extra hurdles just in terms of a social conflict. Um, I see this also having a, a meaning for the very near-term future, just because, as you were already saying, what does this, what, how does that impact our ability to, what is at our our ability to make these things happen right now? And I think um, there's a question of what do you need in place to be able to achieve something like substrate independent minds or many of the other great ideas that we have for the future. And what it really depends on is this luxury that we have right now, all this infrastructure that's in place, the ability to shuttle resources and people around and connect with people, communicate quickly, uh, acquire the financial means to do things. All of that is in place at this moment, but how long is that going to be there? Is there going to be more economic turmoil? Is there going to be more political turmoil? These are very near-term problems that could occur within the next decade, let's say. So how big is our window to, to get something to happen that may eventually impact the very long-term future of our species as a species that can have an impact on what's going on in the universe? There, it, it, I can see the, a lot of these uh, 
interdependent complications that could arise. For example, uh, another concern might be that uh, kind of a, uh, in inversely related to the one you just mentioned, uh, what if a substrate independent mines is seen as uh, the great thing that it could be, and then it's uh, treated as a scarce resource. And so then people who do want it might not be able to afford it. So that's another possible outcome. Uh, and I could also see that anything that delays the, uh, or, or uses up the time window we have to develop the technology um, decreases the chance that it'll be accepted. Because once it's out in the world, and people say, oh, wait, that's not so bad, perhaps. People tend to accept things once it becomes part of their view of mm -hmm. what is the status mm -hmm. quo. Yeah. And for that reason alone, it's important, I would think, to get the early technologies for subjects to independent minds and uploading out there. Mm -hmm. um, does that sound yeah, right? Yeah, that, that does sound uh, like it matters. That, that sounds like it's really relevant to the problem. Um, I mean, we've seen similar things in the past. We don't even remember them because now this is, mm -hmm. this is a while ago. But for example, with pacemakers and other technology mm -hmm. that came along that seemed weird, perhaps. Um, but now right. so many people have them. And it was a matter of adoption. It was a matter of it being out there, it not being considered weird. And yes, you also had the, the access problem, of course. A lot of procedures that are available now in the uh, developed world are not necessarily available in the undeveloped world, or even to many people in the developed world. So access problems already exist mm -hmm. for many of our medical procedures and technology. Uh, even school, things like that. So this is this comes back to something else that I found interesting, which is that many of these questions that we apply to very forward-looking ideas and we wonder if you think, oh, this is a new problem, this is something that we're going to have trouble with, they're actually questions, problems, ethical considerations that we've dealt with in one form or another in the past, in many other cases, and we just have to deal with them again. We have to address them again and not shy away from that. I think I, I, I see what you mean, and I couldn't agree more. It seems that the, the common factor is what you mentioned about the status quo, that uh, the um, uh, native assumption that the way things are is the way they should be and will be, it, even though it's continually been disproven right. <laughs> as yeah. woefully inaccurate, a anything from um, cosmology to... Um, any form of uh, science and technology that explores the physical world, yeah. Yeah. things change. They things do. always change. And uh, th so the, the goal, in addition to the technology itself, would be to speak about it, inform people about it in a way that uh, creates openness for them and an approachability, I would imagine. Right. But I think that, indeed, it requires that we don't only talk about it as a technology, but we also talk about it in terms of the bigger picture. So in terms of all these concepts that we just addressed in, while I was talking to you, um, why does it matter? Because as you said, we tend to only look at a very small sliver of history. In fact, we tend to look only at our own lives, which because they're short, they don't show us how much things actually change over time. And that's why it seems like everything will just be the same tomorrow as it is today, but it won't be. Especially if you have anything to do with it. <laughs> thank, uh, th you. thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much.